The magnificent Perrindales, Corridales, Romneys and Marinos here at Sheep World near Walkworth prove that when it comes to agricultural endeavours, we still lead the world. But while New Zealand has long been proud of its ovine bounty, our ubiquitous multitudes of mutton also serve to remind us of a deeply held fear. A fear that we are in fact not so different to our woolly friends, and that like our sheep, we're a nation of followers, a nation bereft of leaders. Surprisingly few of our leaders have been honoured with public memorials. Perhaps because few have achieved true greatness. There is no state monument to Prime Minister Norm Kirk, but there are three memorial swimming pools. One here in Littleton. One here in Waimati. And one here in Otara. Perhaps our most grandiloquent monument belongs to Sir Michael Joseph Savage. His memorial in Auckland overlooks suburbs dotted with the state houses built by his welfare state. Unfortunately, these now ex-state houses sell for a small fortune and are well beyond the average Kiwi. Many say Savage must spin in his grave at the thought of property sharks and greedy real estate agents getting rich off his beloved state houses. And they'd be right. In fact, thanks to an electromagnetic generator, the former Prime Minister now produces enough electricity to power six state houses and the lights around his memorial. It's hard to know what Mickey Savage would have made of another leader who would benefit from his grand vision of cradle to the grave welfare. He may have begun life in a state house, but by the 1980s, the man in question was living in waterbed luxury. Oh, wait. Oh, I don't know. Let's take it down. Calls like this in the middle of the night are commonplace, and they demand that John Key, straight out of a deep sleep, be instantly on the ball. Can you make me make? Yeah, I can. It's fine. Just do a little and pick it up the morning. Okay, good man. Thanks, sir. This documentary was shot just days before the share market crash. It was a heady time when greed was indeed good and John Key was one of the rising stars of this new golden dawn in the moments before it turned into a golden shower. It's almost true to say that, that when the boys arrive in the morning, it's a bit like me throwing raw meat into the, into the pit or the trading room, as we call it, and uh, saying, eat that and then get out there and kill them. The Elders small trading team is rated highly by its competitors for aggression and professionalism and John Key is its leader. He's the one who tells his colleagues second by second what the price of the Kiwi dollar is and what it will be. Key may have lived the work hard, play hard cliche, but life was not all cocaine and bitches. Indeed, it was quite the opposite. Come on. Good game? Yeah, it's a bit, actually. A bit of Did you win? Uh, I was lucky in three. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Though the material rewards of living with a Forex dealer can be great, phone calls in the middle of the night and constant talk about the price of the Kiwi dollar could be a little wearying. But John Key's wife says she's adapted. I've taken the time to get to know foreign exchange and understand it a bit more myself because at first I was totally bored because I didn't know anything about it. 
but now that I understand it more, um, it's more interesting, um, and I can put up with him chatting away about it. Though the rewards can be great, the work is intensive. In a field where the only commodity you're trading changes value by the second, it can be a mistake to leave the room. Meal breaks out of the office don't exist, and on those days when things are looking grim, even the most basic human activity is pushed aside. How do you see yourself? Well, obviously, it's a, it's a pressure cooker type situation, and um, sometimes when things are going wrong, there is a lot of yelling and screaming. But what lies beneath? Corporate profiler and author John Wareham was brought in to describe the mind of a successful Forex dealer. It sounds as though you're describing an obsessional individual. Right. An almost distorted one. An obsessive person, yes, and a, such individuals are dis, dis, distorted, yes. They always have a, a problem that they're trying to flee from or cover up. As the central player in this daily drama, John Key relishes making decisions almost faster than the speed of conscious thought. 95.15? On the trading floor, Key was bold and decisive. But when it came to question time, the answers seemed somewhat elusive. Can you say how many days you would have lost money? I'd prefer not to, really. But it's, it's relatively low. Why not? Um, it's probably pretty naughty. <laughs> it's hard to know what Coupe would have made of John Key. He certainly would have been amazed to see Key whizzing about in his BMW. For Coupe, the canoe was the conveyance of choice. But for our modern leaders, the horseless carriage is indispensable. In 1971, that carriage was usually a Chrysler Valiant. Well, here we are, Dr. Finley. Let's yes. have another week for you. It's the usual windy reception. Yes, I'm afraid so. Ten years later, the Ford Fairmont was all the vogue, as was driving with a skinful. I'm going to have another drink and then I'm going to drive home. This is a recreation of the night that Muldoon called the snap election and planned to drive home pissed as a chook. Luckily, Don McKinnon was on hand to let down the tyres of his Sierra Cosworth. Two punctures, Don. In 1990, it was Mike Moore's Mauve Ford Telstar TX5 that hinted at the crushing defeat he was about to face. They're going to drive to the um, Labour Party headquarters right, in Bishopdale, <laughs> as I said earlier, and Yvonne's mother's in the back. Looks like she's doing the driving tonight. I wonder if it's normal in that house for the mother-in-law to go and sit in the car long before um, Mr Moore or Yvonne uh, go to it. But there you see Mike Moore driving off. Away from politics, motor racing was Mr Longy's passion, a sport that could accommodate someone his size. Your whole senses uh, accelerate. Your mouth goes dry, your heart runs. Whilst it would be unfair and highly inaccurate to refer to Helen Clark as the town bike, it would be fair to say that she got around using this contraption. It's a Honda 50 step through and it's on display here at Auckland's Museum of Transport and Technology. And just as Helen loved her Japanese bike, the Japanese loved Helen. So much so that she was even honoured with her own TV special. I actually don't use the towel rail, heated rail, anymore at all. Just what the Japanese were actually laughing about is hard to fathom. But there's no doubt that our premiere brings them much enjoyment.
TV One Monday. Watch it, watch it. You meet all sorts of customs. I, I go to room one. Top, 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 top. He's acting odd. No, no, no. But is he hiding something? Any heroin, cocaine? Cocaine. Then a man collapses. What were you doing when it started? Um, but he's not telling the full story. Yeah, we're well, visiting the house, the new house. <laughs> Medical emergency follows border security. Monday, TV One. You got trouble, my lord? I am poorly. Block nose, block sinuses. The Greeks have left a large wooden horse at the gates to the city. Drag it inside, I suppose. Avoid stuff ups. Sudafed unblocks your head so it clears your thinking. Introducing the new all Jeep Cherokee. Here at Pack and Save, we believe that printing circulars every week is a waste of money, not to mention trees. Saving you more money? That's good. Pack and Save. Hug one today. I would. Some kids blast off from breakfast loaded with energy. They're fired up at first but the energy fizzles out before it really counts. Nutella, as part of a balanced breakfast, helps provide kids with the long-lasting energy they need. With over 100 hazelnuts, the goodness of milk, and a GI index of 33, Nutella will help get them moving and keep them going. Nutella, energy to live and learn. People do what they do every day that makes a world of difference. It's the world's biggest game show and now it's coming to New Zealand. Do you have what it takes to win big? Apply online at tvnz.co.nz keyword millionaire. Take the test now. Long before Brotown, our pioneering animators used satire to poke fun at our leaders. the bejesus out of his opponents, often leaving them quivering in a pool of their own urine. Which, although warm, provided little comfort. Disfigured by an accident in the garden, which scarred him at a young age, Robert Muldoon was destined to leave his own mark on the country. 
First, as an economic whiz kid in the Holyoke cabinet. And he's misleading you again. That figure's correct. Leaving old Keith to do what he did best. Good evening, sir. And now the... Look as stately as a moorpork and hoot nice things in BBCs. What has happened today? Well, it's naturally one of great pleasure and um, gratitude to people of New Zealand who've recognised, obviously, the worth of our government. Now, let's, let's make it perfectly clear. Muldoon had a great self-confidence, surety of action, and a style that said, I know what I'm doing, peasant. Trust me. About time, too. A lady says at the back, about time, too. He staged a coup during a pause in one of Jack Marshall's sentences. A more aggressive approach uh, seems uh, to be called for by... Uh, and it was over by before he whistled his last S. A significant and uh, perhaps a majority of uh, our supporters. And when his only capable opponent, Norman Kirk, died, he let loose the dogs of Hustings. Muldoon's time had come, and he swept through the nation as nothing less than our rightful ruler-in-waiting, just minus the toga. These were imperial and impressive occasions. A master of conflict, he shone most brightly when challenged. He'll play against anyone, anywhere. Hecklers were as fish in his barrel. This government's not going to interfere. We're not going to have clowns like that interrupting it. Take that warning right out. Yeah, you better. <laughs> you're not going to like this answer, I can see that. If someone to shout your trip to Auckland, you'll get a job. But my guess is that you'll be scared sick at the sight of it. Down the back, unrepentant. Good on you. That's loyalty. Not all that bright, but it's loyal. I admired him as a performer. I mean, he was, he was fluent, he was powerful, um, he, was, he was probably the greatest political performer of my political life. Such was his popularity, the populace felt strangely compelled to fashion his likeness in everything from money boxes to, perplexingly, margarine. He frequently received impromptu gifts from a grateful and gushing citizenry. It's even got a little end card in it. <laughs> Rob thrilled them with his common touch and frequently cracked one in public <laughs> as he looked out on his dominion beyond the statue of Augustus Caesar. The common man's champion was captured on film being distinctly common. Anybody who's lived in this country, been brought up in this country, is a, is a man in the street. I know him because I'm one of them. Relaxing in his batch at Hatfields Beach in frighteningly relaxing shirts, which matched the upholstery. But surrounded by minions on his side of the house... You know, personally, I support him, and that's it. I wouldn't be in his cabinet if I did His rule became increasingly autocratic and abrasive. You tell me who they are, and I'll have a talk to them. <laughs> he once said, once I really poured into him once at a dinner party at my place, and, and he told somebody afterwards how much he enjoyed me objecting to what he had said because he doesn't get it in cabinet anymore. He was famously frosty on frost. This, this, this so-called sergeant major that would have been tossed out of my unit. And dictatorial, even while in a box. I will not, I will not have some smart aleck interviewer changing the rules of the game halfway through, Mr. Walker. If he didn't like what a journalist was writing, he discovered that he could have them sent to the dungeons. We haven't done very much in cabinet this morning, that is. No, Mr. Scott. Sorry. Something for my staff here. Take him away, will you? Tom Scott wrote such penetrating satire about the Muldoon administration, he was banned from Beehive press conferences and from travelling abroad with the PM.
Well, there's a Chinese proverb that says, one rat's dropping spoils a whole bowl of soup. And, uh... He was in bed the first time I saw him, which was in Bowen Hospital having a, a tendon operation on his hand. So he was in this bed, with all this, surrounded by this sort of snowy white starched bed linen. And in the middle of it, it was like finding something really nasty in the middle of a pavlova that shouldn't be there. You know, there was this... <coughs> and his hand was dangling from a sling sort of in the ceiling. And really, the, you know, quotes I got were mainly... <coughs> um, and I sort of dutifully wrote them down. I was absolutely terrified, but um, he sort of... I think he identified me as, you know, exactly the sort of journalist he liked, which was, you know, someone who would write down exactly what he said. There's no doubt that Muldoon left his mark. From Think Big came the destruction of Cromwell, which made way for the Muldoon Dam, which featured himself alongside Ramses the Great and the other broken up one. His descent into economic madness was complete with the ill-fated Mickeynomics and his proposal to hand out $100 to one randomly selected citizen each week. The Springbok tour helped him to retain power in 1981. But then, in 1984, with terrified minions in tow, there came a miscalculated and drunken announcement of a snap election. The dice was thrown, and the game was at long last lost. Deposed by defeat, he rattled around the back benches, increasingly out of touch and irrelevant. Now declawed, it was finally safe to approach and pat the great tiger on his last day at the zoo. There's nobody here, look at that. There's some... Um... Well, it's a great farewell party. Is not? <laughs> Thereafter, he amused himself with radio and theatre. He was typecast as himself in Terry and the Gunrunners. Yes, yes, I know all about that bit. Now, what's he up to? But strangely, <laughs> although many people made a fair dollar impersonating his chuckle, <laughs> he could never impersonate it himself. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Because I loved her. You great, soft, sissy, girly, Nancy, French, Bender, Man United supporting puff. All new life on Mars, Mondays, TV One. It's the Posty Plus bra sale. We've gone factory direct and sourced world class lingerie from as low as $9.99 for bras and $4.99 for briefs. Plus, buy any two stretch cotton briefs and get the third free. Hurry into Posty Plus. Posty Plus. What if you could lose weight without losing your lifestyle? What if you could eat out and still lose weight? What if you could eat all your favourite foods? What if you could get advice on how to keep the weight off from people who've done it and access online tools 24-7? What if you could join Weight Watchers and get free registration, a saving of $33? What if you called Weight Watchers now on 0800 009 009? Makeup artists love Max Factor's masterpiece flexible brush technology. Now Max Factor have created a new double-ended masterpiece. Step 1, add 70% more visible length. Step 2, a twist of subtle colour for show-stopping eyes. Give length a new twist. Go colourful. Go beautiful. New Beyond Length Mascara, the latest masterpiece from Max Factor. Available from farmers and selected beauty stores. Plus, Australian wine at its peak.
invigoration of Listerine starts in your mouth and keeps on going to give you a blast that lasts. And now, get a free dental check or clean. Details on pack. I came to New Zealand because I was constantly afraid. In my homeland, you can be interrogated, beaten, or even raped. Children sometimes witness these things. You cannot travel to go see friends or family, and you feel like someone is constantly watching you. But I didn't realize the same things happen to women here. The Women's Refuge Appeal helps provide support and advocacy for women and children. Whatever day of the week, enjoy a sub of the day for only $3.90. There's a different regular Subway 6-inch sub each day for the same low price. Sub of the day, lead your way. Only $3.90. Subway, eat fresh. Two brothers begin the trip of a lifetime. Things got really, really serious. But suddenly, life hangs in the balance. It was the worst pain I'd ever felt in my life. An incredible tale of survival and loss. It just continued to get worse and worse and worse. Ah! I Shouldn't Be Alive, Monday, 9.30, TV1. Along this stretch of Northern Beach, Piggy Muldoon would relax, disarmed for a moment in the company of his wife and family. And therein there is no doubt of the one great good which he brought to office. And her name was Fear. Traditionally, it's been the job of the First Lady to stand by her man and keep her mouth shut. Thea Muldoon set the standard as the patient and loyal wife of Prime Minister Rob Muldoon. She sees her role quite clearly. More or less a supportive one. If we go to a factory, I talk to the people at the factory just the same as Bob does. I make sure his clothes are ready. I take a travelling iron and press them in between places so everything is just ready. Things are ready after a press conference just to step into. So off you go to the meeting. So you have to, you have to think of the Prime Minister's wardrobe as well as everything That's else. That's right, yes. It was important for the First Lady to appear as normal as any other Kiwi housewife. I've always just supported him, but I've certainly had no ambitions for myself at all. I just prefer to stay at home and keep the household running smoothly. Unlike American First Ladies, ours were judged not by the state of their clothes, but by the state of their clothes lines. It's very easy to get um, depressed about the whole thing um, because you're really trying to cope, um, firstly, with bringing up the children, secondly, with a husband that's um, not here when you think he should be here kind of business um, when things go wrong, and um, you just get bogged down with it. David Longy's wife, Naomi, was no glamour puss. She shopped at three guys like any other pleb, rubbing shoulders and swapping coupons with the great unhosed. She is the one who fronts up to the people who are themselves on the front line. She is the one who's telephoned, she is grabbed in the supermarket. She gets it from people who in some funny way feel they can't get to me. Are you bottom, living here? From the bottom of my heart, I mean that, yes. OK, I mean thank that. you. He's doing a wonderful job for us poor people. Thank you. Wait till the budget comes out. <laughs> For all their faults, those who lead us deserve at least passing thanks. For they're often subject to ridicule and brown eyes. Although, unlike these simple creatures, our leaders are usually spared the indignity of having their throats split and their carcasses thrown on a pile. In this, our Aotearoa land of leaders. Now at times I'm sure you knew when I've had scraps 
with that bloke blue. <laughs> but through it all, there was some doubt. Although the Japs could help us out, I faced them all, despite them all. <laughs> we'll do it, Mark.